That just means I'm going to get, I'm going to have a reputation for spilling the water. <laughs> Excuse me. I have the privilege of welcoming all of you. My name is Carol Mankiti, and my husband was Ephraim Mankiti, who bought this store a little over 14 years ago from Louisa who passed away before that, yeah. So um, I just wanna welcome you to a place that he loved and we love. My children and I are now the owners of the store. And he felt this was really a very special sacred place with poetry from all over the world. And we're having a nice reading tonight, which is great. So welcome to the readers that are here tonight. And I think there's quite a few people on Zoom here too. And we're happy to have James as our wonderful manager. And our two interns from Bennington, Sky and Lily, they've been wonderful. Their time is almost over here. So get to know them where you can. Thank you for being here. Have a wonderful reading. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lily. Um, like Carol said, I'm one of the interns from Bennington here. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody to keep your masks on and silence your cell phones now before the reading. Um, I have the honor of introducing our first reader. His name is Levi Rubeck, and he's a poet and critic living in Somerville, Massachusetts. He edits and writes on video games, music, poetry, and more for Unwinnable, and is a co-editor at the online literary journal Paper Bag. His chapbook, Lunar Flare, was published by Argos Books, and his poetry has otherwise appeared in No, Dear, Rec Park, Analog Science Fiction, and others. Welcome him now. Yeah. Not that we necessarily need to talk to the people in the back. That's okay. I appreciate the sound guy experience. <laughs> um, thank you, Lily and Carol Grawlier for having us, Cambridge Institution. Um, I'm going to go and take off my mask if that's okay. I could do my Bane voice the whole time, but <laughs> um, thank you to Jose for reading. Um, Paul Halava Ceballos was the one who brought us together, but he couldn't make it today. Uh, so I asked him if he wouldn't mind if I read some of his poems since he'd already sent me some of his books and they're for sale over there. Um, his book, Banana, I've been reading it since he first started drafting it and it's an absolute killer book that would love to have a home on your shelf. So uh, the Donald, High, Donald Hall Prize thought so, National Book Critics Circle nominated. But you don't need to know all that. Let's hear a couple of his poems and that'll really sell you. Where are my cameras? <laughs> Sonnet to the Country Club Ladies at a Madison Park Cafe. Every job is dignified, is easy to say to someone sweeping up your breadcrumbs. Mere tolerance scrubs from sight the labor that complicates your latte. The night shifts, stars, burnish sky, no one such as me. I know how wiping a stained sink basin and scouring a public toilet's wide mouth will draw a person's eyes down like a monk who smolders over a lit match. I once heard a sage from China folded maxims into cranes to float them down the river. He knew the porous paper made them sink. Tonight, I'll sign my name with a wet mop until I make the floor below us shine. Ecuadorian Decima for the Taken. A flower-blessed branch formed the air. Night pulls its hood over a head. 
Where did they put you, you who burned? Can I bend this branch back to you? A flower blessed branch forms the air. Who watered this red offering? In this city, white pickets failed to stop squadrons of loaded guns storming Daniel Ramirez's house where I have a work permit. Sounds like plastic zipped on father's wrists. A spat word planted in the ground grew. My friend, I worry for you. Who turned off the stove? Mopped boot prints. Night pulls its hood over a head. Violence can be a person moved to another state. Despair unexamined as profit is. If a man shoots a young woman, her name is Claudia Gomez. And the man had a bulletproof salary, new Jeep, and belief that she was armed with a birthplace or sunlight made flesh. Where are we? Friends with hair like a wildfire smoke. Where did they put you? You who burned. You with morning washed clean inside. Where did they lock you? Can you eat what they provide? I hear the food is cost effective. Are they clean? Scrubbed warehouse prisons where shadows are scalpeled from hosed down bodies. Our children kept in the same cells with no phone calls, who sings to them? Walls are nothing but feelings that what we exclude is what makes us whole. Is it not wholly the need to protect the people I love or could love? Where does my love end? I persist in this uncontained republic rinsed in urgent dew. My friends, pursued since your first breaths, what songs call you? In what small ways can I bend this branch back to you? And one more from Paul. Excarnation, Elegy. I tend my cousin's Facebook page on charnel grounds, Tibetans feed depart departed to carrion birds as their dead take over the sky. What ways do you show devotion to spirits? My cousin exists nowhere and everywhere. She glows in a friend's hand. Her image floats forever in air, shot mid-leap I follow her new followers. A like lives longer than flowers. Like lit incense, gifts glimmer. No thing is solid you stand on. Blessed is she who sets her heart on fire. Thank you, Paul. Very bold of me to read Paul's award-winning poems and be like, I got some stuff. I got some good stuff. It's pretty good. I actually, I think I have time for this. <laughs> I used to be roommates with Paul um, back in our schooling days in Brooklyn. He was mugged in front of our house once. It wasn't funny then, but he still laughed it off. It's like, it's no big deal. This is the city. This is what we... This is, we knew what we were risking we were getting here, and he still made the neighborhood feel like his. So we would live together and write poems and talk poems and talk music and dumb cartoons and have all these crazy ideas. And one, one night, I was like, Paul, oh, we're going to be so transgressive, Paul. This is back when magazines were published. I was like, Paul, let's get an issue of Bust and an issue of Maxim. And we got these two worlds and let's just like rip out the pages and mix them up and then stick them together and then we'll do erasures out of them. It's gonna be so cool. You take half, I take half, we're gonna conquer the world. Paul's like, yes, let's do it, I'm in. He never did it, but I did. Paul bailed on me, but I still love him. And so I took these poems and I erased and I sanded and I glued and I stuck together and I thought it was kind of cool. But now we're in the internet age. We got to 
try these internet things. I'm not trying to sound like an old man, but I found this program that lets you do hyperlinks between all your poems and put it in a nice little box and you can put it online and just sort of a little experiment in non-linear poem arrangement. So I just wanted to read a few of those. A few of these were published in Ugly Ducklings, so they're old six by six journal. Shout out to more New York stuff. We're in Boston, get out. <laughs> Sacrifice the royal dentist named Fortune. He gave the best rodents. When they ran out of food, they began to fire at anyone. By that time, Brando had speared six moths. Still, he was one forehead, all hardships, a kind of Tahiti. Brando returned, blind, to sell the horizon. He vowed to crash into coral. It was the first gang. So then in each poem, there's like these links. You can pick, oh, this link maybe leads to this other poem. So I clicked on the one about the forehead. Let's see where that leads us. Oh, this one's for Lily. I didn't even know this. See, this is the kind of magic that the internet can provide. Look out, Lily. <laughs> Men toss out emotion, but I'm not a genuine enemy. I mean, I love gossip. And my friends show such kindness that I lied because I could. They didn't give a shit. It left me with a girl who's witty between the sheets. She'd start mocking me as though she were breaking the cliche of bad insane and good insane. Oh, Steve, you're here too. Steve notes that these women give you the taser. Interviews with male victims identified the perils of temporary insanity. Sometimes a chick isn't wild, it's you. I dated this guy, but he behaved like $20 bills. In retrospect, I enabled it. Honestly, this kind of man reveals the garbage. An unassuming dental hygienist. She seemed to be completely animalistic. Not a buttoned up wax man, often abandoned, as Jared puts it, the crazy ones on the verge of drama, who lacked a flat stomach, can't have dessert. This woman is superhuman. Just leave her. Free your fragrance. Men in the world should never wish for a cute blonde. Knowledge is the beginning. If only there were fresh cut football bonuses or juicy steaks, a clean shaven vacation, free flowing and gorgeous. Sounds like your traditional technology traps the glaze of sports before Spain's fingers. Posing in Olympian mustaches, the teammates of Tom had ligaments like dreamy freshmen. How was surgery? Foul. Ugliness. Eight bells shudder. Commence the voodoo orgasms. Janelle's own Rachel comes around by purple text. How you say available from the book of flesh and male fantasy. You were a charmer, right? All right, that's enough of that. Uh, I'm going to read some poems. I've been writing a lot about death. Well, my father passed in 2019 before the pandemic, and I'm still working through it. We're all always working through that kind of stuff. Even when I'm not writing about him, it kind of sneaks in. Um, and I recently re edited this older poem about the journalist Marie Colvin. We, are you, is everybody familiar with Marie Colvin? She was a war journalist, um, famous for having an eye patch being wounded uh, during the course of her work, um, passed in a rocket attack, I think in Syria. I can't remember exactly where. After the death of Marie Colvin. With one eye on shrapnel flush toddlers, no quarter from dust, no witness with shine. 
Cameras low, curses. Rockets rinsed wide on witness and witnessed. Wire says Colvin was undone. Comfortable in noise, eloquent with fire, level with lenses, demanding audience with warble. Weeks to clear capsized trees. Slow croaking diesel shivers with scavenged watts. Permission to document, check, check tape, laid out daydreams of flatbread and Bowie, dazed by the update. Every interview is an outlier. Management before self-expression. The pirate look, eventual failure of endurance. The locals trade on zip tie escapes, a timeline of stencils and paste ups, headlines and chalk, body text bagged then buried, a daily refrain of dissent defanged by lip service. Soon settled for old habit channels. We gave it two goes. Told her not to go by motorcycle, by moonlight, better when oblivious. Still, sold herself in, defined the field beyond makes and models. In a blind desert, one eye watches sins. A fixer holds up his hands to the state glare. A press badge, a wax shield, a delayed memorial, the only word ever kept. Oh, we're looking good. Looking pretty good. My dad was a country musician. He toured around back when you could be a country cover musician and buy a house and get two weeks paid vacation doing that sort of thing. Seems like a dream now. He bends lap steel and banjo by the bit. Reliable rhythm is hard to find, but I could easily pull down a tie dark as a country night. I'll pick up some piano lessons, bad for parties, but good for health, though it may tangle up my fingers. The real trick is a cozy and buoyant fiddler, but at this age, most eligible joints have the spring of an uncracked Gideon's. Out at Feather Falls, Dad hauls in his own backup, plucked piecemeal from an old guitar synthesizer. He bends lap steel and banjo by the bit to shake free those creaky romantics with their last smokes. We are two sips. Walk with me through the cloudy pollen until we're two sips of water from done. Condensation is a chance to wash my hands. When breathing gets tight down in nature's pit, I pull petals apart for the slender frequencies. I forgot the shimmer of Pantone 235 after a few Oroville summers spent too stubborn for sunglasses. The growing seasons set a recurring tick in the eyes. Penitence for growth. These leg bones cawing. He has fought against it. I text my dad, hospitalized again, demoted from his months long reign as icon of chemo resilience, but he's too tired to respond. He has fought against it but can no longer face the annual fires swarming Butte County. 
a lifetime collecting light strings and illegally modded firearms, but raised me not to talk lightly about killing. The onyx coffin held only red sewage and undelivered bones. Death squats by the headlines with hands in prayer. She revs a chopped brass chariot and soars overhead. I get a couple more. Wrap it up. Some stamped energy. I don't believe in ghosts, but neither can I deny an unmeasurable graze. Some stamped energy, a magnet waving distortion over a wood paneled TV. We're desperate for particulars, but quantum transmissions are the real magic. Our fingertips paw the air for any signals. Those spirits wail through space. Everyone we lost crests an unyielding clash of incessant black meaty. A vacant radio station stacking numbers through the pinholed ribbon. My dad's odysseys and obstinance rollicking across the spectrum. So this is a nicer one, still a little deathy, but a little nicer for my wonderful wife, Carolyn. If we are anywhere, it's above the fog. We get together on an astral beach and trade the songs that rearranged our atoms. Chemistry is just candlelit chants to centrifuge the poison from our cyclonic hearts. If we are anywhere, it's above the fog of body washes, navigating hallways by the nose. We are pigeons lashed to the magnets in our beaks. At a cabin on this astral beach, we wail along with the notes that alchemized everything. Thank you. How are y'all? My name is Star. I'm going to be introducing our next Frida. But first, let's get another round of applause, please. please. Like I said, I'm Star. I'm the other Bennington intern, and I have the absolute pleasure today of introducing Jose Angel Aragus, PhD, who is most recently the author of Rotura by Black Lawrence Press, published this past year in 2022, which we have for sale up there alongside a couple other generously offered copies of various other books. Um, his poetry and prose have appeared before in Prairie Schooner, Poetry International, the Ascentos Review, and Occident Engine, among other places. He is an assistant professor at Suffolk University, where he serves as editor-in-chief of Salamander, and is also a faculty member of the Solstice Low Residency MFA program. He blogs and reviews books at the Friday Influence. His debut lyric memoir, Ruin and Want, is forthcoming from Sundress Publications. Please give him a hand. Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Okay. I think that's like a given <laughs> like thing you asked up here. Um, I'm going to keep my mask on. Um, so do let me know if I don't um, articulate or need to speak louder. Happy to. Um, so before I get started, just want to say thank you to all of you for being here, uh, here virtually, um, wherever you've coming in from in the world, um, whatever you've survived to get here, thank you for being a part of this. Uh, so I am a poet occasionally, and on occasion, a poet will... Um, write poems, and sometimes those poems are occasional poems, 
Um, so I've, I've written a poem for this occasion. So um, I just wrote this. Uh, <laughs> uh, haven't revised it, haven't anyone? Anyway. Uh, this is called On Latinx, Latine, and Other News of Late. Republicans acting all holier than thou are trying to control the language. They say Latinx should be banned in Arkansas and Connecticut, at least on government forms, where control of language is on their terms. And it's not just Arkansas and Connecticut. Argentina and Spain have made moves to ban Latinx because they want Spanish only on their own terms. None of this is just. Taking words and identity out of the hands of people are moves to ban people who only want to create a space for themselves. In the US, Republicans see words like identity as out of hand and pursue a thinly disguised anti-woke agenda. They would have this land only for themselves, pin the US to their chosen history, their censorious sensibility. What of the self who wakens to another gender? What of the Latinx whose own cultures, racism and homophobia have them erased from history? What sensible recourse but to forge who we are from what we have? Without Latinx, all that's left is a culture of racism and homophobia. Politicians hunger for our votes and support and think their only recourse is to try to change who we are, what we have. This isn't about us, ultimately. This is about political anger. Well, you can't deport a language. Think pieces and poles are fluid, like language, and our language isn't about you. And to Spain and Argentina, what about Latine? See, you ban one word, another crosses the border. The sea of self pulled further, fluent. With luck and anguish, we languish in our river languages from the Charles to the Rio Grande. Latine. The word proves rain language rails against all borders. Even where I write, is it Boston, Malden, New England? I have rivered languages from the mystic to the Rio Bravo and have puest in a la madre while wading through insults in Boston, Malden, in New England. This republic acts all holier than thou without reckoning with what is holy. Pues a la madre. The difference between holier than thou and growlier than thou means nothing when words are being banned. All I can do is break form, break lines, break, break, break. Thank you all. Uh, I was really proud of growlier than thou. I'm not going to lie. I'll admit that now. Um, should I keep this one? Okay. <laughs> all right. So I'll be reading from... Um, my latest collection, Rotura, and um, it's funny segue that poem ended with break, break, break. Uh, Rotura means break, means rupture. Um, so that is very much a theme for this book. And I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, this first one, um, the book is kind of framed by the 2017 election. So anytime there's a reference to an election, that's the one I mean, um, or the 2016 election, apologies. Um, but you know, when Trump got elected, we, we it's not that far <laughs> back. <laughs> um, anyway, this is a question before the election. My mother asks if I've heard of the KKK. A month later, the election will turn in favor of a man endorsed by them. A month later, my wife and I will begin unpacking how we represent what is not wanted here. Give us not your disabled nor woman, not brown skin of self and family and families. A month later, we will grow quiet, swiping at screens to refresh reality, hoping the next flash of text and pixels will give us reason to speak above a mumbled, grit-lined whisper, to move the air beyond the pause of remembering to breathe. Because she has heard of a man who brings the worst out of people, because she wants to warn me, but is years late to shield me from history, from threats and sideways glances, outright glares, from nights of glass bottles broken behind me, thrown from cars crammed with frat boys yelling, go back to your country. My mother asks if I've heard of the KKK. A year later, I will be thinking of lists in poems, what it is when inventories make space for, stops to see in lists. A year later, I would list different things my mother and I are years late for. Like me asking what it was like for her when she first came to this country. 
or her asking me why I write, why I teach, why I do anything but hide and stay quiet like she asked me to be as a child. A year later, I will have been walking, looking over my shoulder for more than 30 years. The man I am looking over my shoulder, not noticing that I marched behind the youth I was who starved himself and hoped to disappear, too busy looking over his shoulder to know he marched behind the teen I was in black t-shirts, who kept checking and correcting his English and hating his skin, too in his head, and looking over his shoulder to know he marched behind the child I was, alone in garage apartments, staring out the windows at trees and cars, ducking down when a cop car passed and closing his eyes. A year later, it will hit me that these years of looking over my shoulder are a list inside me that inventory makes space for, stop to see the fear inside me. My mother asks if I've heard of the KKK and I feel the worst has found its way into my palm. The worst has me clutching it, hearing it sounded out in my mother's voice. And I know then what I hold in my hands will continue to grow heavy. What I hold in my hand trembles when I cry, my wife cries, friends tell me they cried. When I remember in a hushed, hurried voice, as if we were calling to each other from different parts of a dark wood, wanting to both call out and be found, but also not draw attention, my mother asking me, ¿Has oído del KKK? I feel failure, desengaño, loss, deception, breakdown, caída, defeat, quebrado, collapse, rotura, frustration, amargura, grief. Bueno, pues, sí. One thing that I'll, I'll geek out about about that ending, because I've always loved, I, I knew I was done with the poem when, we got, when I got to this list of words in English and Spanish. And I was just like, yeah, it's like a little spinal cord. Um, and I mentioned less, but um, the bueno pues sí, it's like pues sí is so close to poesia, like poesia, so um, I'm going to geek out about that for y'all. All right, this next poem is called Night Matter. In a house without electricity, what matters is having clean paper and enough light for words. Crouched at the window by the street lamp's light, I write. When the light clicks off, Ask my hand if it matters. Even when I can't tell what word lays at my fingers, I know the force and heat is my matter. My eyes make out the paper as a glow registered by some animal sense that makes it matter. The night sky fills with bits of shell and bone, or so I write in ink in night matter. Since men learned print, no night is wholly black. Since I learned night, my print is holy matter. Frost spoke of being acquainted with the night, having words with it, neither wrong nor right, is another matter. You who read and move on to other matters, the night knows who between us must do the dying. So I like to play with forms. The, the first poem was a pantoum. That was a, could have been a puzzle, but I, got distracted. Uh, we'll, we'll blame neurodivergent for that. Right. Um, but this is this is another pentum of sorts. Uh, if you were if I was being graded, I would fail the, the forms test. But to me, I'm like, hey, this works. Um, this next poem is about Selena Quintanilla, the Tejano singer who um, comes from my hometown, Corpus Christi, Texas. My family's from Matamoros, but um, I grew up in her town. And so she's a homie. Uh, and I, I actually do have her signature somewhere. Uh, she signed a um, uh, some kind of like hotel letter head for my mom. My mom was a, a waitress at the time and so she was waiting tables, so yeah. So Selena just keeps popping up. This is like my third Selena poem, I think. Uh, Selena, a study of recurrence and worry. Somebody died and it's okay to be Mexican. No, really, this is good. I was worried nobody would understand what it means to come from a city named after the recurring body of a martyr. No, really, this is good. I worried a whole generation of young women from a city named for wounds and resurrection would suffer themselves to be stilled and lost. Now I worry a whole generation of friends close their fists around empty beer cans and walk out the door to become lost, distilled memories. You would think no one would sing here again. 
that with beer cans in their fists, mothers would tell stories about a ghost appearing should you sing here in this city, should you ever go on stage. A whole generation of mothers telling stories where not a ghost but a microphone vanishes directly below a spotlight that burns anyone who walks on stage. Different moon in a different sky where it is always night. See, a whole city vanishes below the spotlight of my erratic memory. Corpus Christi, my imagination paints you as an indifferent sky where night after night we tell stories about who we were. You are more than my erratic memory and imagination, more than the name of a wounded returned body. When at night I tell stories about Selena, I know that it is more complicated than the name on a statue, more complicated than somebody died, and it's okay to be Mexican. I know life is more complicated than anyone can understand or hope to become. have an order here. It's all very orderly and, and tagged. All right, so the next two poems I'm going to read are, are long sequences, um, like Moby Dick. Long, no, no, not, not like that. <laughs> it's not Melville. Um, Melville's not even, oh, Melville's poems might be on here. Don't get distracted. Okay. Um, but they, again, I'm, I'm talking Texas. I'm talking my, my hometown, my family, but also talking the world, I think. And this next one is called Four Dirges, and it engages with a, a line from uh, T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, specifically in The Dry Salvages. He says, I don't know about gods, but I think that the river is a strong brown god, sullen, untamed, and intractable. And uh, I carried those lines in my pocket for years uh, when, after I first read them in like 2006, and they finally kind of work with this set of four poems, so, uh, or dirges, I should call them. So this is Four Dirges. Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, Dirge. Thomas, it's true. You don't know about gods beaten and worn like the space left between paired jigsaw puzzles where a child has tried and tried to force the wrong piece in. You might have known about gods who linger, who know lightning bolts, who know bargains and carry swords. But I think you lack the capacity to notice their lack of capacity to harbor and be a hand to shade our eyes. Shaded now, you don't know and died not knowing the slosh of gods and the dark gleam of gods that re reflect clean off badges, hot overpaid hearts. This river god who rears and waits in place like a door left ajar, god that moves and darkens. This is not a being of your thoughts. Water dirge. Tom, do you not know that before boundaries were decided between men separating Mexico and the US, there was water? Before the city lights made us forget the stars and before the desert was made a road and before people crammed into trucks and were called cargo, called nothing back there, officer, there was water. Do you think water is an argument waged between two gods? Think where I believe water is blood spilt between two gods. Do you think as I do that I might mean split and not spilt? Do you know much about the silence so much like a river when I've been seen as sullen, untamed, and intractable? Nuevas, Nueces River Dirge. Tommy. Is your strong brown God also this chosen river, split from brother by distance and legislation, river that empties into Corpus Christi Bay? No, I know you spoke of the Ohio, and I know that river too. But what would you call the hard waters of my home city? What blessings for us who offer up nothing but faces can you think of? What looks back when we hold water in our hands and wait a moment of dark mirror? that we are then made in the image of what we cannot utter, that we are lost in clouded lifelines as we stand outside a door we've had no hand in making. Corpus Dirge, December 2016. T. When the water was contaminated in Corpus, I did not consider gods, did not know them or think them able to help my family who already had bottled water in bulk. My mother, who made sure her sons didn't drink from the tap, who attempted to shower with bottled water a few times, only to have to give up, her arms giving out after double shifts of work. 
When the water was tainted, I took the time to look up maps traced by zip code, the neighborhoods cut off from water, noted that where they lived, my family would live without service for some time. Same for the neighborhoods we used to live in, from Leopard to Greenwood, and yet water had been restored to areas I never saw until I had started driving and would detour through ritzy residentials, or so they seemed at 16. When it was tainted, I knew water had given off light like roads made of glass before I was born, knew that water bore and took in all that fell long before I'd fallen off the map I traced over, trying to think and find any thin reassurance. When the water was tainted, it remained water and would remain water, and all the words wearing down in meaning are my family history, are part of my story. Mr. Elliot, before I was born, you wrote about a strong brown god, but what are gods when there is water and rivers who have nothing to do with what isn't already part of them, if the river is within us? then why did I fear it killing those I cared for? Why do gods beyond belief, knowledge, and thought scrawl out of me, awkward, reverent, and dying? All right, sticking to the, the theme of rivers, um, this next one is called Certain Rivers. Um, and I think I'll, I'll stop to share a quick story. Um, about the title of this book. It was originally going to be called, um, uh, it, the title used to be a line from a Juan Felipe Herrera poem, um, former U.S. Poet Laureate. Um, and I was just like, you know, if I'm going to use that line, I should write to him and see if, see if we'll do a blurb. I've asked, you know, big name big names to do blurbs and gotten silent. So I'm like, okay, you know, see what happens. But he wrote back and um, he wrote me a blurb. And when he sent the blurb, he also um, was like, you know what? I appreciate the nod to um, using my line as a title, but this word rotura, I think, is your is your word. I think everything in the the book is all about this breaking that you capture. And um, I was just like, whoa! I mean, on, on one level, it's a power move, right? Like, <laughs> I'm gonna take advice from a former boy laureate. Um, but also the the humility to be like, you know what? Don't forefront my work. Forefront um, your 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 work, your vision. And I was just like, oh, thank you. So. Um, and every time I read from it, I feel so humbled because I see it. I'm like, man, that guy has it figured out. So, <laughs> so he doesn't know yet, but he's going to have to read every one of my books before they have a title. So um, this next poem has a, it's a sequence, of, a lyric sequence, and it's got an epigraph from Zesla Milos, um, who wrote a poem called I Sleep a Lot. And I, I feel like if I gave everybody the, the prompt, like, hey, let's write poems with the title I Sleep a Lot, we wouldn't go where he went. Because uh, the line that he that I draw from it is, um, when it hurts, we return to the banks of certain rivers. I'm like, damn, that's a, that's a line. Uh, but anyway, this is certain rivers. When a river is crossed, how many families hold their breath? Breath made rivers they cannot keep inside, one after another. The only thought, adelante. Later, with children, with hours of work wearing down the body, these breath-made rivers run through dreams and stories. They tell their children not to voice. Small faces hold still while questions begin to course and shadows dam the back of the throat. I have made a myth of our river. In telling the myth, one river becomes many rivers, and the one my mother crossed is lost in the one I cross now in ink. You can't step into the same river twice, but you can try. The sound will grow, will lap and splash, sound of displacement, sound of will, of wanting, in your mind, sound of steps going nowhere. Water knows how to be lost, has a need for it, just watch. The rain is all scramble and clearing of tracks. Watch a napkin over a puddle, how water goes for broke to be lost clings, rises, soaks the fabric, pretending part like it does in clouds that grow, give, and clear. Shadow is a kind of water in that it knows one way to be lost. Just wait, it says. Just wait. Water knows its way to truth. You can see what lies at the bottom of rivers. You can wash away the dirt to see your hands again. Water is, then, not the truth, but a way to it. Shadow, then, is not a lie, 
but something also passing over truth. Down the street at noon, you cannot look around without seeing others making the same strained face. A country also knows its way to truth, but can choose to pass over it. In this country of water and shadow, truth is strained from our faces. My mother turns to water on the phone. The river of her voice carries the years between us, years where I have strained to catch something of our changing faces. The river of her voice is a kind of truth I know. I see what lies at the bottom of these ears. I wash away the dirt and see my hands tremble. Water knows how to be lost, has a need for it, but it cannot choose. A river turns to ocean and is not lost, just ocean. A river runs dry and is lost, you think. But later it returns and only then do you ask, what is a river? But never answer, happy to have the river. People know how to be lost to others. Crossing rivers helps. People know, but they must choose. And even then, they are not lost to themselves. Mother, you brought me with you over water, over a way to truth, over the distance of your shadow. And in shadows now, we wait for the other to call. Sometimes she calls in tears, and like an earthworm when the rain comes and fills its burrows, a part of me works itself out to the surface to breathe. I can hear the water in her words, flooding sentences of love and regret, cloud what I know how to say. Whatever actual clouds in the distance between her and I rearrange as she continues to break and give herself over to the 10 or 15 minutes it takes to grieve that one cannot grieve. No hay tiempo. Tus hermanos, esta casa nunca está limpia. ¿No ves? Cuida bien esa niña tuya. Lo siento, no hablamos suficiente. Deberíamos. Gente muere, ¿sabes? I know. This voice from other nights, other cold moments when I've stopped in my life to listen, drummed out from the dirt of where I live, and made to gleam like rain in worms, glass bottle shards, the hard face of a television clicked off to leave a house quiet, but for the pleading half whisper, half snore of a woman with no time to grieve. I usually let the Spanish hang in there, but I'm I'm, I'm hearing very much because uh, the the shock of deberíamos uh, no hablamos suficiente deberíamos gente muere sabes which is a very mom line because it's uh, we do not talk so we we do not talk enough. We should. People die, you know. <laughs> Which um, I laugh and I, and I love it because I feel like part of uh, there's a writer um, Norma Elias Cantu who um, is from that part of the world, our part of the world, South Texas, and she's like we we have to, we learn as uh, Latina people um, how to laugh through our tears. So like that kind of like well, you know my students kind of like dude that's trauma. I'm like I know, but it's funny, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Well, yeah, I'm not. No. <laughs> All right, I'm going to read two more poems, and one of them is um, uh, one by Paul. We didn't coordinate this, so I was over there just like, I hope he doesn't read this one. Um, but um, I printed it out. It, it was uh, published in Iterant, and um, the ending of the poem is this image. I'm just going to show it to y'all. If we're over here, there's the camera. Okay. okay. And I couldn't, I was like, how do we get to that image? I don't, I don't know what we're, what's going on here. And I'm convinced, um, I encourage y'all to, to check it out. Um, I'm blogging about it tomorrow. But because um, uh, kipus are mentioned here, uh, Q-U-I-P-U-S, which are these kinds of like um, hand-woven silk like ties with knots in them. And I'm like, I kind of see that in the image. But then I don't know if this is intentional or not, but when you listen to the recording of Paul reading it on the website, um, you hear wind chimes when he gets to this point. And I'm like, oh, are they wind chimes? Whichever one it is, it's it's magical. And I'm like mad because I've never thought of ending a poem like this. So I'm just like, okay. <laughs> uh, challenge extended. I see. <laughs> um, but Paul, sorry you can't be here. We do miss you. Uh, hope you're doing well. And uh, this poem is called Coronary Angiogram. Coronary arteries, iodine flooded. Black serpiginous branches ramified over near invisible beating muscle again and again, repeated with each looped beat, 
From nothing to iodine branches, from nothing to this black crown the muscle wears that keeps it alive, the muscle whose ejected blood forms the crown. At a museum in Quito, I saw knights, I saw knots tied along lines of handwoven silk, beautiful and multicolored, the quipus hung, perhaps the coded names of Incas killed by Spanish, perhaps an art form or both. And I thought that maybe you would have known what they were. There are many poems made of words, but for you, I wanted to make something beautiful. Oh, that's dope. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for, for making beautiful things. Thank you for making beautiful things as well. Thank you to Grolier, James, everyone who was a part of the star for the intro. Thank you for making a beautiful evening, all, all of you who are here. Uh, this is the last uh, poem in the that I'm going to read, and it's the last poem in the collection. And just how the, the first poem deals with the question before the election, these, this is called Questions After the Election. In her story about being told by her white bosses, white secretaries, vote Trump, you better vote Trump, as she punched out from work, as usual, tired and body sore. Does my mother know that she gathered the darkness of each corner of the factory and the darkness of the drive home, switching between stations, nothing sounding right, and the darkness in her mind, listing all the work waiting for her at home? and the darkness of the night over Corpus Christi, and how these darknesses spill over now into every word I'm urged to write. Because nights like these are ink and her story of pretending not to hear, but telling me what she heard, what was said, is a story of darknesses being separated, made distinct as words on a page, which hold darkness in one form until we close our eyes and darkness shifts to darkness shifted. At the end of her shift, does she know about the darkness I will hold for her? Thank you. Well, I think we can all agree those were some wonderful readings. Thank you guys so much for coming. Again, please, one more round of applause for everybody. Thank you all for coming out so much. Um, please feel free to put your, to pick up your chairs, stack them against the wall where the other ones are. Um, we have everyone's books for sale. We got banana, we got some stuff from Rose. We got everything over there. Um, we'll be free, we'll be happy to help you back. We'll be happy to help you guys check out. And I know the poets themselves will be happy to sign books for you. Thank you guys for coming and James, feel free to say anything else you want.